Life's been in a strange loop sometimes. I feel like everything has been repeating itself, but now all of a sudden things feel like they're finally changing. Maybe not though, for the iPad. Apple's iPad situation has been largely the same for the past bunch of years, creeping closer to MacBooks, but not being the same thing. And that brings up the iPad Air 2022, which has an M1 chip and it has 5G and it has a lot of the things that last year's iPad Pro had. But the basic situation in the spring of 2022 is pretty much the same as what we had before. A really good iPad that's not a Mac. After reviewing stuff at home a lot for the past few years, I'm back in the city checking out the iPad Air on a commute. And it's a really nice tablet. It's not as affordable as I'd want it to be, and it's not as much of a MacBook as I'd want it to be. Which means that while I really love the iPad Air in its total design proposition, it may not be the iPad that you need to buy. So the basic entry-level iPad, which came out last fall, that is probably the one for most people. It's a lot more affordable. It has an A13 processor. It's perfectly good. It works with keyboards. It works with an Apple Pencil, but the last gen one. It's got center stage, which is that zooming camera for video chats. Basically, all the stuff that you'd be looking for on an iPad, including this one. The iPad Air does all that stuff a little better. So it's got an M1 processor, which is super fast. It's got 5G optional, which you have to pay up for. Uh, it's also got that center stage front-facing camera, which is really just about digitally zooming and following your face. And it's got USB-C, which doesn't sound like it should be a big exciting feature in 2022, but it's really exciting because not all of Apple's products have USB-C and it's very helpful to have. It also works with uh, Apple's accessories like the second gen pencil, which is already a number of years old, but it's more helpful to snap on the side and Apple's Magic Keyboard, which came out a couple of years ago. That Magic Keyboard is also expensive, and if you wanna add up all the stuff in the iPad picture, including accessories, and what I think is the right amount of storage, you're probably going to be paying over $1,000 easily for this, which is a lot of money. Now, compare that to where the entry-level iPad is $330, maybe you wanna get the one with a little more storage for 480, and then you add an accessory or two, that's a lot more affordable proposition. The iPad I got to review is blue, which by the way, the colors on these don't really show up that much. I mean, I mean, it does look blue, but it's like a blue metallic finish. Anyway, I don't really care about colors, but the blue is, is somewhat blue. But I also, I got the 256 gigabyte model with 5G to take a look at what the 5G service was like using Verizon. Now, using it here in the city, it's not that great. I got in the Washington Square Park about 60 to 80 megabits per second, which is not that fast at all. In my neighborhood, it was more like 290 megabits per second. But the whole idea of 5G, you might expect some sort of massive, powerful, speedy situation. In most instances, I feel like 5G is pretty equivalent to LTE. The thing is, really, you're paying for the cellular upgrade option that costs an extra $130 on the iPad same as always, plus your cellular fees. That's a lot of money. I wouldn't ever buy cellular on an iPad unless somebody was footing the bill. For me, I would just connect to my own mobile hotspot, use Wi-Fi, do something like that. The iPad Air does feel like a slightly watered down iPad Pro. And what's cool is that the main features you'd be looking for, which is the processing power, that's on board here. What this leaves out compared to the iPad Pro are a lot of bells and whistles. The iPad Pro, the larger size, has a mini LED display, which is a little more vibrant. The both models, the 11 and 12 inch iPad Pro, have the same M1 processor, but they have better cameras. Extra rear cameras and face ID on the front, which also allows portrait effect stuff. And both the front camera and the rear camera with LiDAR can do some amount of scanning, which you're into that sort of 3D scanning landscape, that's the one you should think about. It also has slightly faster USB-C connections using Thunderbolt 4. Well, significantly faster, but for most people, you probably won't really notice the difference. And it's also got ProMotion, which is 120 hertz faster refresh rate. Uh, you know, at this point, I feel like if we're speaking to an everyday person, they're not really gonna care about those extra bits. If you're a pro person, you're probably not gonna be getting an iPad Pro right now. 
That's because Apple released the iPad Pro one year ago, right about now, and the question is, where's that iPad Pro update? I don't know. Now, it could be announced in just a few months or later on, and it could have the reported M2 chip, or maybe it won't. Maybe Apple will surprise us and make iPad OS feel even more like a Mac. Maybe that iPad Pro will work in some way towards that picture. But if you're spending that much money for an iPad that's fancy, you might wanna wait, or you really should wait, until Apple announces whatever the heck that is. In the meantime, you're kinda of getting last year's tech at a slightly better value with the iPad Air. So let me tell you some of my very favorite things about the iPad Air. I love the size of it. It's super portable. 11 inches feels like the right size because it's compatible with a lot of keyboards. It's very good for looking at videos. It's not too awkward for holding and reading. I feel like when you get too large on an iPad, it starts to feel like a laptop. When you get too small, it's not as versatile. And Apple doesn't do a lot of multitasking on iPad OS, but that two pane multitasking, which is pretty much what they have, looks pretty decent on the 11 inch, especially since you can adjust the slider a little bit and get to the right size app configuration that lets you maybe put a little bar of extra stuff like a Twitter feed on the other side. I also really like that it has Touch ID. In fact, that it has a side Touch ID. This is the only Apple product right now that has a side Touch ID button you know, on iOS, and I feel like that needs to move into iPhones and the rest of the iPad lineup. It's very convenient, although knowing where it is, is a little weird. I, I basically register two fingers for convenience when working in keyboard and portrait mode, but it works reasonably well. And even though Face ID is very useful on an iPad, it's not so useful if you might still be wearing a mask at places. The other thing I like about this is the keyboard. The Magic Keyboard that Apple makes is fantastic. It's also really expensive, um, but it's really nice for typing. It feels like a little laptop, and it gets that portable thing, which is that you know, it's a more portable, like little laptop compared to the larger size MacBooks. I miss that 12 inch MacBook. I really like small laptops and small things like that. So this kind of satisfies and scratches that itch. But the Magic Keyboard, not only is it expensive, but it also is not very versatile as an everyday case. Just keep in mind that it doesn't fold all the way back into a folio. So if you want to read with it, you got to kind of pop it out and hold it away from the keyboard. Here are the things I don't like about the iPad Air. Its price, even though it's affordable, it's not that affordable. It starts at $600, which comes with 64 gigabytes of storage. 64 is not enough. That's not enough for something that you want to use all the time and not worry about running out of space. So then you're gonna kind of go to the 256 gigabyte, which is the only other storage option. That's $750. Now that's a lot of money. In the case, you only get a USB-C and 20 watt charger and the iPad, nothing else. So you need to buy a case for it to protect it. You may want to consider that pencil. And again, the price keeps going up and up. And then you start to look at, do I just get the iPad Pro, which starts at $200 more than the base, $800, but it has 128 gigabytes of storage. And this is how you go up the Apple storage upgrade path and suddenly end up spending more than you intended. So I'll stop there. The other thing I don't like with this is the OS. iPad OS is versatile, but look, it needs to evolve. And at some point, Mac OS, iPad OS, Apple says they're not combining, they need to combine. And I feel like we're already seeing tendrils of that. You have stuff like universal control that's now in 15.4 that allows you to use your trackpad and move between iPad and Mac. You've got a lot of apps that share increasingly similar interfaces. But still, it's not the same thing as a MacBook. And I really want those to combine because I want to be able to have just one device. I would love to do all my work on this when I'm on the go. I find that it has enough weirdnesses that I'm still gonna to want to carry, sort of take around my MacBook as an insurance policy. And that defeats the whole purpose of, well, can I just travel around and just work on this? You could just work on an iPad, but you're gonna to have to find a lot of weird fixes to some quirky situations. And then the final thing, the really the one thing Apple needs to change on the hardware is that camera. Center stage, that digitally zooming camera tech, super useful. But what it didn't change is the position when you're chatting with somebody. Apple puts the camera on all of its iPads on that shorter edge instead of the longer edge. 
I've gone over this over and over again, asking for the position to move. But you look at Apple's studio display, which has center stage for the Mac, that studio display has the camera at the right point, right at the top long edge, which means that when you chat with people, you look normal in your, in your eye contact orientation. I feel like when I'm talking on an iPad, I'm sort of staring off like this. And then I have to look over here unless I hold it vertically, which I'm not gonna do if I have a keyboard case. Just shift that camera placement, Apple. Just move that thing over. It'll be wonderful. Everyone will thank you for it. A lot of people don't care about iPads, and yet a lot of people use iPads all the time. Some people are budget shoppers. Other people like to draw a lot on iPads. And that's the other thing. You know, what are you using this processor for? The M1 is crazily fast, super powerful, and what apps are you using for it? If you're a graphic designer and you're thinking that you might use Pencil and do all sorts of really cool graphics and art projects, then that totally makes sense. If you maybe think you're gonna video edit on an iPad, which wouldn't cover that many people, sure. But if you're doing work on it, if you're watching movies, playing games, you don't need this type of processing power. It's fun, but and maybe it future-proofs the iPad, but against what? We don't know what Apple's product lineup's gonna look like in the next few years, so it's even hard to say that that qualifies as future-proofing. The iPad Air is very appealing, but I feel like Apple's iPad product lineup is so staggered that it's hard to tell where the rest of the lineup is going this year. And because of that, I'm really hesitant to say that this is worth spending that much money on right now. I feel like you might wanna wait, especially wait till Apple's developer conference, which might have other iPads, or it might not. Maybe think about it for yourself. Maybe see if you can get away with spending a little less. That's the story of the iPad Air this year. Super powerful hardware. Maybe the software can come next. For more, click on the link below for the full review. If you have comments, leave them below. Thanks for watching, and uh, see you next iPad.